Alright, today we're going to be looking at the classic science fiction novel, We, by Yevgeny Zemyatin. If you've read Brave New World and you've read 1984, then you definitely need to read this book as well. In fact, We is not only a book that came out long before these two books, but is often seen as being a big influence on these two books. Especially Brave New World, which some people think was based on, or very much influenced by, We. I can't say though that I agree that Brave New World is all that similar to We. They both seem to me to be picking on very different themes, but one thing that I would say is that We is a fantastic book, and I preferred it to Brave New World, so it's definitely something worth reading if you haven't read it before. Part 1. Summary We is set in an unspecified future time. It is told through the journal entries of D-503, a spacecraft engineer who lives in the One State, an urban nation constructed entirely out of glass, cut off from the natural world. The one state is organised according to the laws of reason and mathematics, and the city prides itself on having detached human beings both physically and psychologically from nature, art, and irrationality. D-503 is initially a loyal servant of the one state, and the story is told through his diary entries, which he is writing to tell future people of the greatness of the one state. But things start to change when D-503 meets a woman called I-330, a rebel who flouts all of the one state rules. She drinks, she smokes, and she spends most of her time outside of the city limits. D-503 falls in love with I-330, and is drawn into the world outside of the one state, and the rebels who plan to destroy it. Part 2. Science fiction, world building, and exposition dump. So although I do love fantasy, and to some extent science fiction as well, one of the things that I dislike about both genres is that, unlike other genres of literature, there is a big tendency for writers to overload their books with exposition dumps. And you know, to some extent, it makes sense why they would do that. If you spend all your time crafting a fantasy world, maybe even putting more time into creating the world than into the plot itself, then you're going to want to tell everyone about everything to do with this world. And you're also going to be concerned that, if you don't explain everything, that people aren't going to understand what's going on. But unfortunately, Oftentimes this causes such writers to overcompensate and put way too much information into their books. And so you just get a lot of irrelevant world building, which isn't really that interesting and detracts away from the story that's being told. And this actually, I would say, is true for both Brave New World and even more with 1984. The early parts of the book do have a lot of that kind of world building going on in a way that makes the books, at least in those passages, not as interesting as they could be. The good thing about We is that it doesn't do any of this. It throws you straight into D503's story, and he fills in little details about the world, but only where those details are relevant. And as a reader, that can be a bit disorientating, but I really enjoyed it because it meant that you had a book that wasn't particularly bloated, and wasn't bogged down with too much of an information overload. It does mean that the book is a bit hard to get into, especially at the early parts, because you just kind of like, you know, what is going on, what, what's happening in this book. But after a time, as the novel progresses, and you get little bits and details about the world, you come to understand it a lot more than you initially feel at the beginning of the story. And as for the world building itself, I think it's fantastic, and like I said in the introduction, it's very distinct from the kinds of worlds that get created in 1984 and Brave New World, even if there are some loose connections between all three of these books. Although We is definitely a book that has a political context, and I'm not really going to go into that in this video, but it's something that you definitely want to look into if you're interested in the book. What I find interesting about this book, as opposed to, say, 1984 and Brave New World, is that it also seems to touch on very general themes as well. It's a book that could very much criticise today's society, where we're putting things like efficiency and effectiveness before everything else. If something's quick, like getting your supermarket uh, self-checkout, then that's better than having to deal with a person. If it's easier to call someone over Zoom than see them face to face, then we do that. And all these things are kind of taking us away from real human contact because we value efficiency over in-person interaction just because the in-person interaction is a bit more difficult for us. And Demi Antin's story seems to be directly challenging this worldview and showing how detached it makes us as human beings. It's also a story about how human beings seem to have an impulse to detach themselves from nature. And except this is dialed up to 11 in the story with the people living in a glass city, in glass houses, where everything is made out of artificial material, and pretty much any kind of human behaviour is regulated to the point where it's not very human at all anymore. Even something like sex, which is probably the last like primitive vestige of humanity left, is something that's become regulated and you have to get a little slip, a pink slip, in order to actually do it. 
For these reasons, I actually found that the world that Zamiat and create in this book is way more relevant to the worlds that we get in 1984 and Brave New World. Although everyone always talks about how we live in a 1984 kind of world, I don't really think that's true. But I think that the way and the world that's created in this story is much more like the world that we live in, where we push things like efficiency and effectiveness above everything else, where we push STEM field subjects above the arts because these are the things that make money and that drive progress and efficiency. And we seem to not really value the creative arts as much as these things anymore. And so for those reasons, I think that the book actually is a lot more prescient for today than these other two big classics. Part three, Innocent and the Garden of Eden. We is written in a very distinctive style, which at first, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't really gel with, but as I read the whole book, I really started to get into it and I appreciated it quite a lot. The characters in the story, as I've said, are living in a very clinical world where they're completely detached from creative ways of thinking and they're not really in touch with their volatile emotions. Everything is sterile and clinical in this world. And that's reflected in the prose style. The prose is a journal entry from someone who lives in this world, and his voice as a character really reflects how clinical his life and existence is. There's no waxing lyrical, there's no high emotional passages and spilling out of emotion. There are only some small periods in the early part of the book where D503 gets a little bit emotional, but it's mainly about the one state, and even then it's still not particularly flowery or over the top. Everything is very stilted and mannered and controlled, and it really does just reflect the world that Zamiatin has created here. But then as the story develops and D503 starts to actually get in touch with nature and he falls in love with this woman, everything starts to change in the prose. It no longer becomes quite as stilted as it was. It becomes a little bit more erratic and crazy and human. In the early parts of the story though, what was interesting about this prose style is it made D503 out to be sort of childlike in his way of thinking. It really does feel like this is a kid who's, you know, a pretty clever kid who's learned to write reasonably, uh, in a reasonably sophisticated way, but there's not that much substance to what's being said. Everything is just very simple and staid. There's nothing particularly interesting going on. And so it really did feel like D503 at the beginning was just this innocent little child character who becomes more adult as the story progresses, which I think was really interesting as a move, even if it is a bit jarring to read, because after all, this is an adult, but he just doesn't come across as an adult. He comes across as very immature and naive when you first meet him. I think the prose is definitely one of the best parts of the book and is what makes it a lot more distinctive from other dystopian novels that I've read. The innocence of D503 is also really important and is connected to some of the broader religious themes in the story as well. The idea of this one state where people are kept in this state of innocence, unaware of their own nature and unaware of anything outside of this glass dome that they live in, is very similar to the idea of paradise and the Garden of Eden. And of course, you also have I-330, who is the woman that introduces D-503 into this wider world, acting as a kind of Eve character who's introducing knowledge to D-503. But although the story does have some parallels to the story of the Garden of Eden and the story of Adam and Eve, it is ultimately a secular story. After all, the one state has rejected religion because it views religion as some primitive vestige of uh, inferior humanity in the past. But what's interesting is that the one state is committing itself to a similar sort of utopian fantasy that we see in the story of the Garden of Eden. In both cases, you have this garden or this place that's kind of, a, it's meant to be a stomping ground of innocence. It's where innocent creatures dwell and they think that they're completely safe there from any kind of evil. But just as in the Garden of Eden, you have the snake, you have that one little bit of evil that's there to taint people. Likewise, in the one state, there, there, is, there are these rebels who aren't necessarily evil, but they are there to connect people back to nature and back to their full human characters. Now, I won't spoil the ending of the story, but what I will say is it's a bit ambiguous in terms of what happens in the future. In both cases, there seems to be a warning about utopian thinking going on. Although in the Garden of Eden, there's obviously lots of other things going on as well. At least with we, it seems like the idea that's being presented here is that we can't actually create this perfect society. We can't actually have this utopia because there will always be small destructive forces in the world. And as much as we might try and eradicate them and arrogantly think that we can get rid of them, they're always gonna be there bubbling underneath the surface. And what I also like is because the book isn't religious itself, the one state isn't a religious world, it shows that just because you get rid of religion and superstition, this kind of quasi-religious way of thinking still arises in people. And there's still a tendency to live that dream and think that we can actually live 
in some utopian world when that just isn't the case. Part four, imagination versus logic. Another one of the big themes in the story is this perceived battle between reason on the one hand and imagination on the other hand. The one state as part of the story decides that creativity and imagination are bad things. And this sort of makes sense because if you're creative, then you're gonna come up with new ideas and that might instill change. But what the one state seems to want to do is to completely eradicate change altogether and just have everyone living under the dictates of the one state. So creativity, they think, is dangerous for them. And so one of the big things in the story is that they come up with a way of removing the imagination from human beings altogether. For the one state, it seems like the imagination is actually more of a disease than something that could actually be helpful. And so that's why they want to remove it. They think it's actually something that's corrosive to not just human beings, but to their future happiness. Now, the ending of the story, like I said, is open. And this is quite important because it means that it's not clear as a reader whether this idea is actually true or not. In leaving this fight between reason and nature open at the end, Zamiatin isn't saying that either one of these things is actually going to be able to win this fight. But in my personal opinion, it seems to me that it's this part of the novel where the one state possibly starts to do something quite bad. Because it seems to me that you actually need creativity and imagination to preserve a state. Yes, imagination and creativity do lead to change, but they can also lead to improvements. It takes a bit of imagination to see that there's a problem and then come up with a creative solution to it. And so the one state in removing the imagination seems to actually be damaging itself at the end of the story because it's removing the capacity for positive change, not just the negative change that might destroy the society. If people are just meant to follow the blind dictates of reason, then it's gonna be pretty easy to start working out how those people are gonna act. And if the one state wants to travel and explore the universe and control everything, they're gonna be a pretty predictable enemy because they just lack the imagination to do interesting things to outmaneuver people in clever ways because they're just following a calculus with no imaginative capacity behind it. And so it seemed to me that what Zamartin was getting at here was that you can't really have a successful state without the balance of reason and imagination. If you remove imagination from people's minds, that's actually going to be a damaging thing for you because you remove the possibility for positive change. And I think that's why the ambiguous ending of the story is so great, because it leaves things open. Unlike a lot of dystopian novels like 1984 and Brave New World, where it often seems like the bad people have won at the end, that's not necessarily the case with we. Things left open, there's still a possibility that things might change in the future. And I think that just creates a much more realistic idea of utopia or just of politics and different kinds of states and organisation in general. The kind of message that I got from the end of Brave New World and from 1984 was that these societies will just continue forever and that they've won the game. But we seems to be a little bit cleverer in that because it recognises that many great nations have thought that they'll live forever and go on forever but they all end up collapsing. And so the ambiguous ending seems to me anyway, to reflect that idea. If you've read the book though, I'd be interested to know what you think about this conflict between reason and imagination and what you think that Zamartian is trying to say about it. Do you think that you could just run a society purely on logic or do you think you need a balance of the two? Part six, conclusion. So We isn't my favorite of the classic dystopian novels. I think I do prefer 1984 because of just how bleak the ending is. I just think it's amazing in terms of how depressed it makes me feel. But I do think that We was a fantastic book and I really enjoyed it. The prose is very unique and distinctive. It's got some very interesting themes. And I think unlike some of the other classic dystopias, it has these much more general themes, which are a lot more applicable, I think, than some of the ideas in these other classic dystopian novels. If you've read the book, do let me know what you think about it in the comments. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. But that's it for this video, so take care everyone. Ta-ra!